hearing Ann read that gospel passage again is just um, kind of uh, overwhelming to listen to because there are so many details in that, in that passage. As you have heard me say before, John is written later than the other Gospels, most likely written after the destruction of Jerusalem, most likely written while the church was basically in diaspora as well, uh, and while um, people were trying to reconstruct um, how to be Christians in places and how to remember the story. Remember that uh, in this uh, Gospel of John, Jesus delivers the Holy Spirit in a much different way than it was written about in, in Luke Acts uh, 30 years earlier. So it, it, I call it the do-over gospel. You know, the story wasn't working uh, for everyone, and so John wrote another story. The details in this are amazing. I'm not going to speak about all of them. That's like a Bible Bites meeting on Wednesday night kind of topic. But I am going to touch on that. I just want you to know that if you go home and look that up, it's not in the bulletin on the Communion Sunday, so you can't take it home and uh, look it up. If you go home and look it up in any version, you will find that there are many, many details. We, of course, are hearing it in the inclusive Bible version uh, that we um, you know, have written. I, I just offer that to you as a moment of amazement at that particular text with everything that's in it. Let us pray. Bless us, loving God, as we continue to be in worship, as we continue to be in connection with each other in this space. We know that this will never be the same again. We will never be in exactly this situation again. And so therefore, we know that you are with us in unique ways today as we are with one another uniquely. Bless us as we continue in our worship. We know you do by your spirit. We pray that you will continue to anoint us as we are hearing wor your word, hearing words from one another, thinking words, singing words, praying words, and we hope that your word, your reason, your logos, your logic will come to us in a way that makes sense to us and helps us be able to go into the next week as ministers of your gospel. We pray, loving God, that this will be a time when, as has been prayed so many times through the years from ancient days, the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth are acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. They didn't recognize him at first. You know how it is. You, you see someone in the distance, and especially if you're in a boat, <laughs> bobbing on the waves, it, it, it's, it's hard to focus. So at first, things are a little shaky, so they don't recognize him over there. Who's asking about our fish? Could it be the tax collector? Wondering how good it had been? Well, that's not going to be any help because the, the take wasn't that great. Won't have to pay much tax. So it takes something more for them to recognize who it was and sometimes it takes something more for us to recognize our friends, especially if you don't expect to meet them in that moment. Maybe it's the voice. How are you doing? Maybe it's the actions. Come over here. So let's see what's going on in the gospel today. As I've said before, each gospel tells the resurrection story differently. Since we are in the Eastertide season between Easter morning and Pentecost, we are hearing what the writers want us to remember about the days after the big event. The Gospel of John gives us, as I said, a very detailed account of the incidents. 
It sounds like a celebrity sighting on the beach. Have you ever had one of those? We know who it is, but we don't want to say anything to seem uncool about being excited. I think it was the same for them. And like the friend and brother Jesus said he was, he helps them and he makes them a meal to offer hospitality, which remains a major action of faithful Jewish tradi tradition. And Jesus more than fulfills their economic and nourishment needs. The overflowing fishnet can be understood as a direct connection to the nets left behind when the twelve were called as disciples. Jesus brings the disciples out of challenging waters and brings them full circle around a campfire on the beach. It's a simple relationship with profound outcomes. The ones who are fed and supported are the ones who will carry the message into the future world. The example of Jesus is to do the feeding and nurture. That's our example. And that is why we are here today. We are feeding and being fed. We are supporting and being supported. Our spiritual food is real and our interactions are the evidence of resurrection, even to this day. As a 16-year-old church, we have our moments of sweetness and then sometimes we don't. Like a teenager, we are still growing and trying to figure things out about ourselves and our future. We are not alone in this. Lots of churches are facing what, future, what experts call future uncertain. This is much different from when many of our parents were in the post-World War II years of the 1950s and 60s, and churches had positive future assumptions. That time was called future certain. The culturally assumed belief then was that if you did the right things and followed the rules, you were going to do well in life. That was one aspect of the American dream and church visions were part of it. Then the actions of our government leaders inspired disillusionment. The actions of our business leaders inspired greed and fear. Some combination of both transitioned our national values from giving a lift and offering a hand to get your own and I'll make sure I get mine. Selfishness became a value, not a vice. Respect and human rights gained the disrepute of being called political correctness. We are now eating the fruit of seeds planted over the past 40 years. This food is not even close to being as nourishing as the fish that Jesus served on the beach. Switching gears for a moment, I think it is right for us to acknowledge that in the midst of a huge range of news this week, a spiritual voice crying out in the wilderness fell silent in the past few weeks. A 37-year-old woman who was a Christian writer named Rachel Held Evans died yesterday after falling ill from the flu and then having terrible reactions to treatments. One medical setback left, led to another and her life left what Shakespeare's Hamlet calls this mortal coil. She stepped into eternity she could only once imagine. And now she knows the grace and embrace of God. Rachel was widely known in evangelical circles as their woman who challenged their conventional thinking from the inside. She ascribed to orthodox ideals and sought to apply them with contemporary wisdom. As a result, she challenged what some thought certain 
and hugged those whom some declared abominations. She rallied for women in ministry. She embraced LGBTQI, uh, the community, and she supported marriage equality. This brought the wrath of many to her work and the love of many more to her door. I did not know her work, but when the news of her illness broke this week, or over the last couple weeks, the Twitter sphere I am slightly connected to became filled with prayers. Then her unexpected death brought an outpouring of tributes. I think the key to her reach was the outreach of her love. It meant she encountered hate, but also meant her words nourished hearts, opened minds, and saved lives. She persisted, and so must we. The New York Times obituary says, an Episcopalian, Miss Evans left the Evangelical Church in 2014, she said, because she was done trying to end the church's culture wars and wanted to focus instead on building a new community among the church's refugees, women who wanted to become ministers, gay Christians, and those who refused to choose between their intellectual integrity and their faith. I say Rachel Held Evans saw Jesus on the beach as her example and did what she believed to emulate his ministry in her writings. We do too. In today's resurrection appearance, Jesus tells the fishers to fish. In other gospels, the post-resurrection, Jesus appears to disciples who are afraid of the powers that killed him. They cower in self-centered rooms of blame and feeling shame. Jesus comes to them through the walls and locked doors and offers his first resurrection words. Do you remember what that word was? Peace, shalom. He demonstrates presence without retribution. In these stories, the writers are trying to rescue and reassure followers and believers that the resurrected one is among them with power and motivation. Us too. In today's episode, Jesus goes to the beach to find his disciples back working at ordinary lives and not having much luck. And when they listen to him, their needs are more than met. When they gather around after throwing away pretense, they find insight and care. 2,000 years later, we gather in a desert. We are trying and building a community of love and faith. Sometimes we get discouraged. Regularly we suffer tough news. And then when we dip our nets in the living waters of friendship and community, there are times when our nets are full many times over and our nourishment is at hand. The Gospel writers were doing their work to give hope to people living in terrible and transitional times. And we can do that too. I read an article last week and posted it on Facebook that some of you may have seen that talked about how the economic decisions of previous decades and business attitudes of today stack the decks against smaller local churches like us. There are hardly any cultural assumptions that support small church life. Many activities other than church life take priority. The public actions of churches and religious leaders alienating themselves from so many people have not helped either. Here in our valley, congregations and community groups, I know of many people so badly pained by church relationships in the past that they have great personal hurdles to clear 
before they can even walk through those front doors in any church building. And that is why we have to be ready to recognize the values and mission of our resurrection faith and do the best we can to offer support and nourishment to all who show up. All of us who show up. All of us who show up every week. Everyone who shows up the first time, the second time, the third time. The importance of our ministry is proven by the way we've been able to minister to people in many ways. The proof of our ministry pudding is in, is that the people we know are eating and benefiting from the ways of what we do, including ourselves, in our hearts and our souls and our minds and our strength. Now, on a very practical level, our moderator, Jack, will be happy to hear me say that's why we need elected officers and ministry coordinators to help keep this boat afloat. And we need volunteers to help pull in the nets and financial support to keep the waves of resources ready and available to keep bringing us to shore again and again and again. We have to be able to support the great work that our daily ministries provide. And it's wonderful to be recognized among our friends here and in the distance that in the grace of God, much is happening in the spirit of love as it surrounds us and inspires us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.